Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Thank you for joining us this evening. I trust you're having a great day. Even if your day perhaps has been busy, but I do trust you are having a great day. If you're here on the Zoom platform, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TCV, FM, Christian Radio, we just want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. Very, very glad that you're here with us this evening. We're starting a new theme. Our new theme is the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. And our theme is Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. And verse 14 in summary says, And when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then Jesus will come. The preaching of the gospel, the content of this gospel is that Jesus is creator, redeemer, sustainer, and that he's coming back as king of the entire universe, Lord of the entire universe, and is worthy of all of our praises because he is God. I've learned recently that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And that being said, he can identify with us from a human perspective. But he also can intercede on behalf of us from a divine perspective. And this makes Jesus so unique to the human race. So uniquely positioned to be our Lord and our Savior. And so again, we just want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. If you join us on the continent, from the continent of Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, South and North America, where we're broadcasting from, we just want to welcome us all to FSM Daily Digital Show. We are blessed today to have, as our honored guests, my friend and my colleague in ministry, Dr. Lawrenson. I'm looking forward to hearing what Dr. Lawrenson will share with us this very day. So far, he has been sharing with us the parallelism, if you know, between the books of the Bible. He started from Genesis and working his way through Exodus, Number, etc. And he's showing us how all of these other books intersect with Revelation. It connects with Revelation in one way or the other. Revelation is a concluding book. And he has really opened my eyes to see Scripture in respect to the Revelation from this new perspective. In fact, he, Dr. Lawrence is the first person that I, have, I really demonstrate in such a clear manner with precise detail analysis how the various books of the Bible intersect or connect directly to the book of Revelation. And so if you're here today, I just want to let you know that you're in for a treat. You're in for an awesome show. As it is our custom, we strive on a daily basis to have a show that is Christ-centered, Bible-based, and relevant to our life as we live here on planet Earth, the last days of this Earth history. And I can say the you know, last days of this Earth history because when you look at so many things that are going on in society, in our families, even in our personal lives, and when you see what's going on all around us, you and I have to conclude it. We have to conclude it upon the abundant evidence that we're living in the last days of this earth history. So I'm looking forward to hear uh, what Dr. Lawrenson would share with us this very day. But I ask you just to bow your head with me as is a part of our custom that we ask God, the Holy Spirit, uh, to direct our thoughts, our words, and our deed, so we can glorify Him. And words, he, put, he could put words on our lips that will encourage each other in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good God of heaven, we just want to praise you because you're worthy. When we look at the writing of the book of Psalms, when David come to the last few Psalms in the book of Psalms from he focuses his energy on calling our attention to the fact that we were created to worship God. 
In fact, there one point that David mentioned that let every living thing that has breath praise God, praise ye the Lord. So here we are now, oh God, we're here to praise you, we're here to worship you, we're here to remind all of us that you are worthy to be praised. Father, in the process of praising you, we pray that you will be merciful unto us, particularly those that are vulnerable among us because of sickness, because of various issues that we face as a human race. In Jesus' name, amen. First, we want to call upon, or we want to give credit to the Arnaldo Swift and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening. We truly appreciate their sponsorship of this very show this evening. Ronaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, your one-stop shop for all your health and wellness needs. At Ronaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, you'll find Primary Care Clinic, Frugal Health and Wellness Store. The Frugal Health and Wellness Store is a health store with a difference. Offering supplements, herbal blends, teas, vitamins, essential oils, vegetarian meatless protein, and wellness classes. Call us. Let us cater for your events. When it is time to take care of your annual or chronic health care needs, visit a clinic or schedule a televisit online or by phone. Call us at 470-880-8080 to make an appointment or visit ornaldoswift.com to book an appointment online. With over 38 years of practice, we specialize in internal medicine, general practice, mental health, wound and ostomy care. Dr. Palmer and his team invites you to visit Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center located at 5386 Snap Finger Woods Drive, Decatur, Georgia. While you're there, visit a natural juice and smoothie bar, sample or vegan salads and snacks at the in-store deli. You can call in your order at 770 900-2679. Shop in store or order on DoorDash. Again, we want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center for sponsoring this show this evening. And if you have a business and you would like to sponsor a show or a series of shows, uh, please reach out to us so we can discuss the detail and how you can sponsor a show, our series of show. Thank you, and we're looking forward to hearing from you soon. But at this time, just before we hear from our 100 guests at this point, Dr. Lawrence, my friend and my colleague, first we want to hear special music, and then after special music, the next voice that you will hear is Dr. Lawrence.
clearly we want to thank the Anthony family for that beautiful selection, reminding us that Jesus is coming soon. We're preaching the gospel, and a part of the gospel proclamation of the gospel is the reminder that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming soon. Now, without any further ado, please help me to welcome our honored guests, my friend, Dr. Lawrence. And welcome, Dr. Lawrence. and looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us today. Thank you, Pastor Bonaby, for the gracious invitation. I thank the uh, wonderful uh, duo, the duet, the, uh, the singers who rendered the special music. I appreciate it. God bless you for your contribution to this ministry. Uh, this evening, I want to share, I promised last week to share the screen. I think it was by request, and I'm going to see if I could do that. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to take it from there. Hopefully, my technolo the technology on my end works. Uh, Pastor Barnaby, does it uh, reflect on your screen? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. So as you had um, rightly introduced um, the exposition on the Old Testament, as we compare and do a parallel analysis with the book of Revelation. So we're going to continue from where we left off last week. We completed the book of Deuteronomy. And so we will continue from there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to study your inspired word. We ask for the aid of the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, be the one to direct us and to rightly divide the word of truth. But we also pray, Father, that you will give us receptive hearts. Bring about conviction and conversion to your word so that we will apply it, live according to the word, and that we will be able to have the spiritual vitality, sustenance, and endurance to overcome the enemy. Keep us until the day when Jesus Christ will burst the clouds of heaven to claim us as his own, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. A biblical exposition on the Old Testament and the New Testament books of Revelation. It is important, as I mentioned uh, for, throughout my previous presentations, that the Bible is a complete book from Genesis to Revelation. And when we take the time to examine, to analyze, and to do a comparative analysis of each of the books of the Old Testament, we come to one conclusion, and that is the Bible is truly inspired and it has one author, and that author is God. While at the same time, he designates over 40 different writers, different men and women to compile and put together the, um, his word, to communicate his word to his people. But the overarching author, the one who is orchestrating, who gives all the insights, the one who motivates, the one who directs is God himself. And we're going to look at what he has done, but through the word, but then I'm going to just by, by way of clarity and emphasis, let me say to our viewers, our listeners, that in case it is the first time you're coming to, on this platform, because I sent some invitation to a, a few of my friends to, uh, to join in and to listen, let me say to you, that the easiest way to read and understand the book of Revelation is to look at the other books of the Bible, to look at how it relates to the other books of the Bible. And by the way, um, 
There are a lot of people who claim that the book is sealed and that it is incomprehensible. This is far from the truth. So when, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Revelation from the beginning all the way going back to the end. Because, you know, the, the last book in the Bible is the book of Re Revelation. But it is important that we understand that as it is the last book, it summarizes all the other books. In fact, you will find segments of each of the Old Testament books, including the New Testament, in Revelation. Amazing. Astonishing. So while we look at the end of the Bible, the end product of the Bible, the, we will, we will go, we're going to, what we will do is to parallel and to bring about a comparative analysis between the prologue and the epilogue, the introduction and the conclusion of the Bible. Then we have to follow by comparing chapter with chapter, verse with verse, and word with word. This is very essential. When we do such a uh, compar comparative analysis, we compare, what we do is we compare similar symbolism with those in the same book and with other prof prophetic or prophecy books. We do this metho metho methodically, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Very important. Also, we look at names, numbers, words, etc., in each of the chapters of each book. And then we compare them to Revelation. What we, what we will find, or what you will find, is a harmony, a synchronization, unity, cohesiveness between the book of Revelation and all the other books of the Bible. Now, someone asked me a question some time ago. And the question is, well, suppose Revelation is not the last book in the Bible. Suppose it was just uh, the compilers and the writers who decided to just put Revelation as the conclusive book. I said, well, the internal evidence in the book itself proved that it is. You see, because the ultimate fixer and the ultimate organizer is God. God is the one who organizes, orchestrates, and decides where, when, and how to place his word in a proper chronicle or chronology so that it will make sense to those who read the word of God. It will bring about enlightenment, it will bring about a broad understanding, the scope, the height, the depth, the width of the word will come to clarity. It will come to such a clear, distinct revelation that the one who reads, indeed, the word of the book itself will be fulfilled. Blessed is he who reads and those who understand and those who take to heart the words that are written in this book. So my dear friends, may God continue to guide us as we take the time to study the book of Revelation in conjunction with the other books of the Bible. This is what is known in the circle of um, academia or, or theological academics as intertextual exegesis. Intertextual exegesis or looking at the internal evidence found in each book of the Bible. This is very important. This is a classic way to examine the word of God. And there's going to be only one conclusion when we follow such principle. The conclusion will be that indeed the word of God harmonizes, it is unified, and it is inspired. So we're going to begin with the book of, we're going to continue rather with the book of Joshua. Joshua and the book of Revelation. Last study was uh, Deuteronomy. And then we continue with Joshua. Joshua and Revelation. And one would imagine, how could the book of Joshua 
relate? How could it harmonize with Revelation? What are the similarities between Joshua and Revelation? Well, the answer to this is found in the internal evidence. When we do intertextual exegesis, we compare verse with verse, word with word, uh, symbolism with symbolism, and we looked at them, we could see clearly that there is something that is truly inspiring about the word of God. And what that does essentially is that it builds faith in the word of God. To those who are skeptical, to those who are doubting, to those who are disconcerted with the way uh, men have misrepresented God through his word or have uh, preached heresy, things that are totally uncharacteristic of God. And as a result of the way we find scrupulous, or should I say unscrupulous, uh, preachers and disingenuous pastors who have misrepresented God by using his word for the wrong reason. For those who have been uh, disenchanted and who have lost faith, I want you to know that this exercise will help you to reignite your faith in God and to go back to his word and to earnestly and sincerely apply the word of God to your life. So Joshua chapter four, very, uh, very interesting. Chapter four, verses one through 11. What we find there is that when the children of Israel were about to cross into the promised land, they're about to cross the river Jordan, God under the leadership of Joshua, gave specific instructions that they should take stones, stones and use it as a monument. 24 stones were to be taken from the riverbed of Jordan, 24 stones. And those stones were to be used as a memorial you know, stones are very foundational. Stones are very important in terms of structure, durability, in terms of steadiness. And, um, and, and also it speaks of covenant agreements and promises. People use stones as boundaries during the Old Testament times. So God gave Joshua specific instructions to carry those stones with them into Israel. And then when we read Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter four, verse four, there we see that there are 24 seats, 24 seats designated as the foundation upon which the 24 elders occupy their position in the presence of God. Now, when we look at the, the language, we are looking and making comparison with the symbols. The 24 stones and the 24 seats has something in common. Because without the stone foundation, the 24, which represents uh, in the Old Testament, the 12 tribes, and then in the New Testament, we see the 12 disciples, it is important that we understand that God uses the stone, he used the stone in the Old Testament to prefigure as a type of what is to be in the New Testament. And then when we look at Revelation, we are seeing the symbolic similarity, the language of the 24 coming to bear, that tells us that there is a symmetry, there is a uniqueness, there is a collaboration, there is a, a, a unity of purpose that God is conveying a special message to us 
through symbolism, through types and antitypes. When we go to chapter 5, chapter 5 of Joshua, chapter 5, particularly verse 12, and you have your Bible with you, you could follow in Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. We also find that the manna, the manna, the bread that came from heaven that God gave the children of Israel, by the way, they ate of that bread, the manna, for 40 years. 40 years. But as soon as they entered the promised land and they start eating of the corn of the land of Canaan, then the bread from heaven ceased to fall. Cease. God ceased to provide for them because then that they were in the position of providing for themselves because they had their own land. The land of promise became theirs. They had their own land. And because they had their own land, the land of Canaan was subdivided among the 12 tribes. And as a result, each tribe had a portion of the land. Joshua was not only a commander, but he was also a surveyor. He surveyed the land. He was one of the 12 spies, by the way that was sent by Moses to spy the land. So he scout and he went through all the length and breadth of the land of Canaan and he brought back to Moses a good report. And as a result of his knowledge of the land of Canaan, he was in the position to subdivide, to measure and to survey the land and to give it according to each tribe what that which God had designated. So they had the land in their possession now. As a result, the Bible says, when they started eating of the corn that was grown in Canaan, then the manna, the bread from heaven ceased to fall. So now we look at Revelation. Where do we find manna in Revelation? In chapter two, verse 17 of Revelation. Very interesting in chapter two. Of Revelation verse 17, God says to the to modern spiritual Israel, God says to us, if we are obedient, if you we are obedient, we shall eat of the hidden manna. So there is the language symbolism, there is the parallel. God's promise, my dear friends, has not changed because his character is unchangeable. And so therefore, he keeps his promise. Guess which promise God keeps? The promise that he had made with Abraham. And that God, by virtue of his unchangeableness, we as believers can rest assured, we can depend upon the word of God, the Bible, the ins written inscriptions and directions given by inspiration to the prophets, we could rest assured that whatever promise God has made in the Bible, it will be fulfilled. It will come to pass. Powerful stuff. Now let's go, let's continue. In chapter six, verse seven of the book of Joshua, chapter six, verse seven. Interestingly, when they entered the land of Canaan, uh, they faced the obstacle of the city of Jericho. Why Jericho was an obstacle? Because the dwellers and the residents of the city of Jericho, they defied the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they vowed, they vowed to fight against the Israelites and to push them back where they came from. Now that does ring a bell as to what's going on today in modern Israel. But however, that's for another day, another time, another subject. But the significant lesson in chapter six of the book of Joshua is that the specific direction God gave them that God told Joshua seven priests had to be selected with seven trumpets. And those priests had to match ahead before at the, at the front of the army of Israel. By the way, they had no weaponry. God told them, no, have the priest 
seven priests in front of the army, an army without sword, without spears, without shield. And God told him to march around, march around the city of Jericho once a day. And on the seventh day, on the seventh day, they had to match seven times. And at the end of the seventh round, the seven priests will sound or blow the seven trumpets. And when that happened, when the seven trumpets were sounded by the seven priests, the walls of Jericho came down. The walls of Jericho came down. The city was captured without the children of Israel lifting a sword. God fought for them in a miraculous way, just the same as he had done previously on previous encounters, beginning with the Egyptians in Egypt when they crossed the Red Sea. And then throughout their journey, God continued to manifest his power on their behalf because God had promised them that he will protect them. And today, my friends, if we put our trust in God and we allow God to fight our own battles, he will win the battle for us. By the way, God has never lost a battle, never has, never will. So who is fighting your battles today for you? Are you fighting on your own? Have you, you really considered the amount of times that you've lost so many bouts? Well, it is time to take a serious uh, introspection, a serious look at the way you have been fighting your battles. You see, the Bible says that we wrestle not, the Apostle Paul, that is, says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, our, our warfare is not carnal. It is not, it, it, our warfare is not natural. It is not a, a, a fleshly war. It is a, a spiritual warfare. It is a spiritual warfare. Therefore, we need to have a spiritual armor. And by virtue of having a spiritual armor mean that we have to depend on God to fight the battles for us. Having said this, let us turn to Revelation. When we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, interestingly, what we find there is amazing that in chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, we see that as, the, as a spiritual Israel, as God's spiritual church and people, embarked upon the against the forces of evil when the world will begin to wage war against God's people which has already begun by the way there is the symbolic blowing of trumpets seven trumpets are mentioned <laughs> seven trumpets just like the seven trumpets were mentioned in the book of Joshua who is standing in opposition to God's people right now? The world. The world. So in a symbolic way, Jericho, Jericho is a type of the world. The people of the world, they have turned their backs on God and the majority do not listen to the Bible, to the word of God. And so as a result, the blowing of seven trumpets will announce the destruction of the world. Just as the blowing of the seven trumpets in the book of Joshua announced the destruction of Jericho. The destruction of this world is imminent, my friends. How do we know it's going to happen? Because what happened? has already been fulfilled in the past is evidence and proof that it will happen again. So now we have it. 
but there's more. The seven priests are mentioned in chapter 6, verse 13. In Revelation, we find the parallel, seven priests, chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Everything, you know, to precision, it is amazing. What is the purpose behind this juxtaposition? What is the purpose behind this parallelism? What is the purpose behind comparing text with text, scripture with scripture, symbol with symbol? What is the purpose? The purpose is, my friend, it is this. God is showing us how uniquely inspired the Bible is. Most importantly, to invoke in us faith, to trust, and to believe in the word of God. There was a time many years ago before my conversion, I was a doubter. I used to doubt the word of God. But I need to testify and to admit to you that this time has long gone. It has been evaporated. Why? Because the word of God has substantiated itself. It has proven itself. It is its own best interpreter. So when you read a statement in Revelation that doesn't seem to make sense to you, the best way to understand it is to compare it to the other books in the Bible. And when you compare it to the other books of the Bible, everything comes to light. Clear as crystal. So my friends, we're going to turn to the book of Judges. I don't know if I have time, extra time, but let's try. This is because there's so much material to cover, so much to digest, so much to unravel. So hang on with me. We'll try to see if we could cover the book of Judges compared to the book of Revelation. Judges, Revelation. Where do we begin? We begin at chapter four. Chapter 4 seems to re-echo, re-echo seven trumpets of victory. We find it in Judges chapter 4 verse 7. Remember, this is Judges. This is not Joshua. This is Judges. Seven trumpets of victory is mentioned in verse 27 of chapter 4. And then we find in chapter 5 verse 10, God says he shall sit in judgment in chapter 5 verse 10. In chapter 20, we find all the tribes of, the, of Israel is numerated and mentioned in chapter 20 of the book of Judges. And then we find in chapter 5, verse 3, a statement is made, O ye kings, O ye princes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. A song, a song, a, a, a temple song was inaugurated and the singing of the song, rather, should I say, the lyrics of the song is one that is truly eye-opening. And we're going to see how this plays out in Revelation in a while. Also in chapter 20, verse 38, there is mentioned the, illu the illusion of flame with smoke rise out of the city. There was a pronouncement made that was based upon the con conditionality that if the residents of the city did not repent, then that city will be burned down and the smoke will rise. God make that prediction in Judges. In chapter five, chapter 3 and verse 4, and uh, God says, hearken unto the commandments of God. You see, the commandments of God was contingent upon the judgment to follow. If they obey the commandment, then the judgment will not fall on them or it will not uh, follow them. But the disobedience, the, the annulment and the breaking of the Ten Commandments or the law of God was a sign that judgment will follow if they don't respect or obey the commandments of God. So let's go now to Revelation. Let us go now to Revelation and look at chapter 11 of Revelation verse 15. Now we see uh, the language motif, we see the similarity, we see the comparative analysis 
intertextual exegetical analysis, the similarity, the sameness, the unity of the word of God in Revelation speaks to like Judges is having a conversation, as it were, with John in Revelation. They had lived uh, almost 2,000 years apart, but yet still, it sounds as though the two prophets were having a conversation at the same time. Amazing. It shows us, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, how uniquely inspired the word of God is. Each book of the Bible unlocks Revelation and Revelation complements the other books of the Bible. Trumpets of victory. God has promised victory to his people. Now, you will not doubt that uh, how the children of Israel gained victory over Jericho. Oh, yes, you know, the ruins, the archaeological finds of the ruined city of Jerusalem speak eloquently to the fulfillment of the word of God. We have proof. We have the evidence because the ruins of Jericho is there to reveal that the children of Israel, without, without raising a sword or a spear, conquered Jericho. Jericho was defeated. And as a result, the world will be defeated. The trumpet, what is the symbolic meaning of the trumpet, the blowing of the trumpet? That will be another study. I have another compilation that I have uh, on the blowing of the trumpets, but it symbolically represents the announcing, the announcing of the judgment, the coming judgment of God. The preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel in a symbolic way announces the coming judgment. The, we are literally, what I'm doing right now is I'm literally blowing the gospel trumpet. Those who take heed will be saved, and those who do not will be destroyed by the coming judgment. I need to let you know that not all of the residents of Jericho perish. No, 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 not all perish. There were some people that were saved from the city of Jericho. It is absolutely clear who they were, their names are mentioned. Have you heard of Rahab? Rahab and her household, her entire family, their lives were spared. Interestingly, we find that her vocation, her or her occupation was not one that was quite colorful, um, attractive, but very colorful. Um, she had, she was a lady of unsavory, uh, unsavory, uh, should I say occupation. She was a harlot. That's what she did for a living. But yet still, in spite of her moral impropriety, in spite of her, uh, uh, disgraceful occupation, she found grace in the eyes of the Lord. She was saved. Why? Because she believed in the God of the Israelites. When she heard how God opened the Red Sea and how God blessed them with raining manna from heaven, bread from heaven, for 40 long years, God provided them with water in the wilderness. God took care of them during the day with cool shade of the day cloud by day that kept them cool from the burning sweltering heat of the desert and then in the night the same cloud that kept them cool turned into a pillar of fire and provided warmth because the temperature drops at night and gets extremely cold so God preserved and protected them from the frost by night what a God what an amazing God 
So Rahab heard of the news. And she says she is no longer going to hold on to heresy, false teachings. She's no longer going to doubt the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She renounced her profession, her vocation as a prostitute. She gave that up. And she also discarded all false worship, including idolatry. She took her stand with God and his people. And as a result, there was an agreement made between her and the 12 spies. And they told her, because you have given us safety and protection in your home, and you confess your faith in God, because while they were there in Rahab's home, protected by her, they gave her a Bible study, of course. You see, when people have been good to us, we must also take that opportunity to give them a crash course on the word of God, on salvation, on truth, mercy, justice. That's what they did. And the woman got converted. She accepted the gospel. And they told her, well, what you have to do is to put a red cord in your window, hang it from your window, so that when we match around Jericho and the walls would come tumbling down, you will be spared. Your life will be spared. You will be saved and protected and delivered. And she did it. She was obedient, obeyed the commandments of God. That red cord hanging from her window represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. That red cord that hung from Rahab's window was a symbol of the blood of Jesus. You remember when the children of Israel were moving out of Egypt? God gave them specific instruction that they should put the blood of the slain lamb on the doorpost, the windows, and those who were in-house, when the angel of death came, saw the blood, they were spared. The Passover was initiated. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amazing. Rahab's life was spared because symbolically she put the red scarlet cord hanging from her window. She demonstrated faith in the living God. Today, as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed, being preached, being promulgated, we are preaching the blood of Jesus Christ, the lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross. When we confess Jesus Christ and we embrace and accept the preaching of the gospel through the sounding of the trumpet, we will be victorious. Our lives will be spared from the coming doom, from the coming judgment, from the coming visitation of divine judgment. The book of Revelation truly summarizes the judgment. In chapter 20, verse 4, talk about he that sat on the judgment seat of God and that all of us chapter 22 verse 4 says we all must appear before the judgment seat of God to give an account of everything that we have done under the sun my dear friends it is paramount it is it is of paramount importance that we take heed to the word of God because Revelation is speaking to us today. In chapter 7 verse 4, just as the 12 tribes are mentioned in chapter 20 of the book of Judges, in chapter 7 verse 4, the 12 tribes of Israel are also mentioned. Balancing, creating a balance act through divine revelation. Jack supposing and putting in front of us the unity, the cohesiveness of scripture, man, that tells us that the Bible is truly inspired. Which book on earth you could find such parallelism that spans over thousands of years? None except the Bible, the word of God. 
in chapter 15, verse 3 of Revelation, says the children of God, they will sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And they will say, oh God, the same, the lyrics, remember I mentioned about the lyrics, oh ye king, oh ye princes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. There we see those who will be victorious at the end of the age. Revelation 15, they will sing. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. And then in chapter 18, verse 18, the uh, revelation says in chapter 18, verse 18, that the smoke of her burning, that is the wicked city, symbolically represents the disobedient, disloyal uh, people of the earth. They will be burned and their ashes will go up in smoke. And the same language, the, the smoke, the flame with smoke motif and coming out of the city is reminiscent and it is given in a parallel form in Revelation chapter 18, verse 18. And then in chapter 14, verse 12, they that keep the commandments of God. Hallelujah. And then we find in chapter 3, verse 4 of Judges, my friends. Chapter 3, verse 4 of Judges, when God says specifically, hearkened unto the commandments of the Lord. Chapter 14, verse 12 gives the announcement here are the patience of the saints here are they that keep the command where well, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keeps the commandments of god that keep the commandments of the remnant of the seed so you see the same church the same people of god that started the journey from the stock of abraham continued through all the wilderness experience and through exile and through all the different epochs and the different dispensations, today, the remnant, the remnant of that same movement, that same congregation, that same church is going to be seen as keeping the commandments of God. So in these last days, the, the, the attention, the direction, or should I say the redirection of us as a people of God is to go back to our roots. And what is our roots? The keeping of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Remember, by faith, it was faith that led them through the Red Sea, faith that led them through the wilderness experience, faith that led them to conquer Canaan and to reside, to become sedentary throughout the Canaan land, the distribution of the land. Remember, we are not going to inherit an earthly Canaan, but we will inherit a heavenly Canaan. And that is the place where truly there will be no more war, no more tribulation, no more attacks from the enemy, but God's people will be victorious eternally. I am looking for that day. How about you, my friends? It's going to be a glorious event. It is my prayer today that as a result of this presentation, that your faith in the word of God will be reignited. It will be deepened, broadened. It will be strengthened. And that your spiritual appetite will, you, you, you will have a desire to eat more from the buffet of the word of God. May God bless you. May God keep you. May he strengthen you until next study, my friends. So now I'm going to turn over to Pastor Bonaby, and I know you have some questions you would like to ask. So anyone with any question, uh, how the message has impressed your heart and has brought meaning to you, let us hear from you now. I think that's a great question. It's a great way to lead this conversation, Pastor. Uh, perhaps, perhaps if someone in the audience um, have a statement or a question and how the word so far has touched his or her heart. Anyone? Well, remember, we're going to come back to you. We're going to come back to you. 
My first question to you, my pastor, is you mentioned uh, the, the, the 12 stones that God instructed Joshua to pick up the 12 stone as a marker, if you may. And you contrast it with, or compare with, the 24 elders. Why is it relevant and significant, um, the 12 stone and the 24 elders? Because everything God does, he establishes it on solid, rock solid principles. And the 24 elders, as presented in Revelation, indicates and it shows us that, the, that God truly spoke through the elders in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament, they would have found, Peter talk about, that, the Apostle Peter talk about um, Christ the chief cornerstone and they as living stones and God used them as living stones. And then we find that, you see, God spoke through the mouth of the prophets. You know, um, all the leaders of Israel, they were elders. Today we have the symbolic uh, revelation in, 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 in the 24 elders. And also we find, Pastor Barnaby, we also find that the city, the holy city of God has 12 foundations, 12 foundations. And the, the gates has 12, the city has 12 gates and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are on each gate and the names of the 12 apostles are on each of the foundations. It is also interesting to note that as we looked at the parallel and we go back, you see, we're making comparisons with symbolic language, symbol with symbol, verse with verse, word with word, event with event. And so we piecing them together and it becomes a wonderful uh, tapestry of divine revelation. You remember when Elijah the prophet was on Mount Carmel the, 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 there was a conflict between true, truth and error, between right and wrong, between the true God and the false God. The gods of the God of Baal versus the true God. The true prophet Elijah versus the false prophets. And then when what happened was their prayers were not answered, but Elijah's pro prayer was answered and it, test, it indicated that he was the true prophet and that the God whom Elijah served was the true God. How many stones did Elijah use to build his altar? 12 stones. 12 stones. How many tribes were there in Israel? 12 tribes. How many apostles we had? 12 apostles. So it is not accidental but providential. That the number 12 keeps showing up over and over again. And when you add 12 and 12, you get 24. So 24, my pastor, so covers the both God church, his Old Testament church and his New Testament church. Is that a fair um, conclusion or interpretation of the number of the 24 yeah, number? It is biblical. We didn't go outside the Bible to prove that. It is internal. We are looking at the internal evidence. So the Bible uh, interprets itself. We don't have to add nor subtract. Let the Bible speak. Let indeed. Bible speak. Indeed. I, I truly appreciate the clarity that you have brought, you have brought, to, uh, you have brought to it. So how do you, how do you speak of the group that cling to the 144,000 and it becomes so significant to them that they spend a great portion of their life trying to be of the 144,000 to the point that they sometimes neglect to live a practical life here on earth. And at the same time, how do we don't ignore the 24, um, 144,000 and live balance, live a balanced Christian life and don't go from one extreme to the next? You know, um, 
one of the things about biblical truth, when, especially when we're dealing with prophecy, the language of prophecy, the symbolic language of prophecy, is that we have to be careful not to speculate. <laughs> I like that. And there are a lot of people who like to go to the edge. They want to, to, to know the temperature of hell, <laughs> every piece of furniture in heaven. They would, you have never been to heaven, but you want to count every piece of furniture that will be in heaven. And God forbid, nobody wants to go to hell to measure the temperature of hell. I'm using this, this algorithm, this hyperbole type of speaking to tell everyone who like to delve and probe in undefined uh, symbolic statements that what you do not understand, do not add nor subtract to it. Let the Bible do its own interpretation. Now, here's the thing about the 144,000. Um, the 12 tribes that are mentioned, you see the number 12 and the number 24. And we look at, in fact, last week's Sabbath, I preached a sermon and um, we looked at the amount of days that the children of Israel spent in the wilderness, the amount of years, I'm sorry, that they spent in the wilderness, 40 years, okay? 40 years is a generation. And um, we find that the amount of miracles that were performed during the time that they sojourned there is also very important. And I did a little calculation and I discovered that, hang on with me, that 40 years, 40 years is equivalent to free, um, you have 360 days per year. Each month consists of 30 days, right? The Jewish calendar year, mm -hmm. each month 30 days. So a year gives you 360 days. If you multiply 360 days times 40 years, you know how much you come up with? You come up with 144,000 days. <laughs> okay? Now, would I now I, take I, the liberty... I, I am taking out my calculator here. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so would I take the liberty in saying that because they spent 144,000 days in the wilderness, that we would have to spend 144,000 days here. No, no, that's speculation. What that does is to show us the uniqueness of prophecy. We don't have to speculate around that. It is designed to build faith in us. So now to determine who will consist of the 144,000 is not our business. It's not our role. That's God's role. God is the one who determines that, not us. Not us. So it is a, an exercise in futility to determine who will consist of and who will not consist of. You know, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses have gone bonkers over that, and they determine now that only the 144,000 will receive communion. When they have communion, so only the 100. So who, who is to know who the 144,000 is among the Jehovah's Witnesses? That is something that is so... Um, you know, it, it, it is mind blowing how they come up with that to determine among the country. Say, oh, you sister, you are uh, you you look to be one that should be one hundred forty thousand. You brother, you uh, come on, a speculation. So it is an exercise in futility. Now another thing that's very important about that is that we find that among the twelve tribes mentioned. There are two tribes that are not included. You remember Dan? Dan is not included. When you read Revelation chapter, chapter um, 5 or chapter, you find the tribe of Dan is not mentioned in Revelation. So if you have to go by the literality, the literality to say, well, you have to come from that specific tribe, then Dan, if you were from Dan, then you would be excluded. But that doesn't make sense. Why? Because Galatians 3.29, the apostle Paul solved the riddle. The Apostle Paul says, if he be Christ, 
then he are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, you know, in Ephesians 4, says we were who were foreigners and 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 um, for uh, and, and 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 excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. We are all Gentiles. We are not Jewish. We are Gentiles. And so therefore, how could we have access if we are Gentiles? So it is not literal, it is spiritual. So by being, by virtue of being grafted in Jesus Christ, by virtue of being Christ, in Christ, Jesus Christ integrates us into the, the family of Abraham spiritually. Then we are now spiritual Israel, not literal Israel but spiritual Israel. And therefore, the fulfillment of the 104,000 is not literal, but symbolic. It represents. Why? We go that, we look at Revelation 19. There, John says he saw a multitude that no man could number out of every tribe, nation, kingdom, tongue, people. But the 144,000 precedes the great multitude, meaning that they are a sample or a preliminary group leading to the greater group. God does that in the, he did that in the Old Testament before the, the harvest of wheat or barley or corn. There was a miniature harvest known as the first fruit. So the first fruit was not the complete harvest, but it was just the preliminary one leading to the greater one. So in symbolic language, God is showing the world what happened in the Old Testament is being prefigured in the New Testament, but symbolically, not literally, but symbolically. Indeed, I appreciate it. I wonder if there's a statement or a question at this point from anyone in the audience. Yes, indeed, we want to hear from the audience. Is there a question or a statement? Well, if you don't have any question or statement, then I, I do have one more for you. You mentioned, Pastor, in the presentation, you mentioned the, the Passover. As noted in the Bible, the Passover is when the children of Israel were in Egypt, and God, through Moses, told him to put blood on the door post, if you may, an angel of death will pass over and they will live. Then you contrast that with, or compare it with Rahab in the Jordan when she was there. And, oh God, you, you mentioned that her dress and her red rag is a symbol that God mercy will pass over her and it was pointing towards um, Jesus' blood. Tell us more about that, please, and, and so we can relate how God rescued the Israelite in one manner and he rescued Rahab in a different manner, but all point to Jesus Christ's death and Calvary cross. Tell us more, please. In Revelation chapter 5, in Revelation chapter 5, the statement is made there that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. Now we know Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God because John the Baptist made the announcement when the day after his baptism, John the Baptist lifted his hand toward heaven and said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. So Jesus Christ is the true Lamb of God, but Jesus Christ is a symbolic, is the symbol of the Lamb that was slain you remember Abraham? He was about to slay his son. God stopped him and said, no, I have provided myself a lamb. So now Jesus Christ is being portrayed and presented in Revelation as the true lamb of God. But then the problem that we have is, how could Jesus is presented as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world when he only died at Calvary? Meaning that the promise that God made at the beginning was so secured, so assured, so real, that it is as though it had already been fulfilled. I like that. For 
does not change his mind. I like that. So because of the concreteness of his decision, you could take that to the bank and cash it. Because even though you were not had, we had not yet been born, but the promise of our salvation had already been secured from the foundation of the world. That tells us how powerful the prophecy, the prophetic statements and allusions are in Scripture. You know, my pastor, when you shared that with us, who came to my mind is our friend, the late Dr. Payne. Oftentimes, he would share with us that God does not predict. God tell us what is. And as you were talking about the assurity, the assurance that we have in the promises are particular, the promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God promised God, this same promise was so trustworthy and reliable that Jesus could be able to say the lamb that was slain from the foundation or even before the foundation of the earth. And so you are implying here that even before humanity fell into sin, even before God created us, the human race, even before God created the cosmos, gee, God have made provision in Jesus Christ that should humanity fall into sin, then God will come and die on our behalf, even though we never have to sin. But should we do it, then God will die in our behalf. So that point resonates um, or, or expand from Adam and Eve, or, or spawn from Adam and Eve to the last person that will born on planet Earth. Am I still being biblical here? Yes, and you know, the point here in that revelation is the blood. There are a lot of people who are trying to gain salvation without the blood. The Bible says without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. You remember Cain and Abel? Mm -hmm. The distinction between the two sacrifices the two offerings, the offering on Cain versus the offering of Abel. Cain was a tiller of the ground. He decided he's going to bring an offering of the fruits of the ground, vegetables, you know, fruits, whatever he had. He brought that. God did not ask for the, the offering of fruits and vegetables. God asked for the offering of a lamb. Because the offering and the sacrifice symbolically represents the Redeemer who would save humanity because of the sin that Adam and Eve had committed and they were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Fruits could not redeem them. Vegetables cannot redeem them. You cannot be a vegetarian and expect to go to heaven. Vegetarianism does not redeem you from sin. Cain tried it. Cain was the first vegetarian. <laughs> Abel brought in a lamb to God, and that is the offering that was accepted. So it means that righteousness by works, human performance, and let me repeat, there are some people who are trying to go to heaven based upon their own performance. They try to make it without the blood. They will not succeed because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And what that means is that the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, it is only through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that we can make it to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. What, by further explanation, it is good to keep the commandments of God. It is honorable to be a Sabbath keeper. It is all good to follow the principles and the precepts. But the principles and the precepts cannot procure salvation for us. If the keeping of the law and the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, was sufficient to save us, then Christ did not have any reason. He, he should not have come and died. He should not have come and died because we could have made it without his sacrifice on the cross. It was because our obedience at best, our keeping of the law at best, could not procure salvation, Jesus Christ had to come and die and share his blood for the remission of sins. 
so that we can receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. These are the immortal words of Jesus Christ. And so to all our friends who are bent on righteousness by works, I used to be one. God is telling us that it is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Pastor, are you telling me that once we have Jesus, that we don't have to keep the law, we don't have to keep the Sabbath? No, that's not what I'm saying. I am saying is when we have Jesus Christ, we will keep his law and we will keep his Sabbath. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. You know, you know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great way to bring this show to, to, to an end. Doc, whenever you come uh, on the show, I always learn something new. You know, Pastor Marsh always state that Dr. Lawrenson is a scholar <laughs> and I appreciate the clarity upon which you have presented the word of God uh, to us in such a clear manner where we can also in a practical manner. I truly, truly want to thank you for that. Given what you've said to us, if you should make an appeal to us at this point, what would your summary appeal be to all the viewers that are listening to us right now and those who maybe be listening even at a later date on a television network or social media platform what is your message to them what is your appeal to our hearts right now the appeal is to all those listening the appeal on the presentation for this evening is just as ancient israel was about to enter the promised land, Jericho was stand in their way. God assigned seven priests with seven trumpets. The number seven is a number of completeness, a number of perfection. The sounding of the trumpet represents the, the sounding of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. We today, spiritual Israel, we are about to enter not the earthly Canaan, but the heavenly Canaan. But before we enter the heavenly Canaan, there must be a sounding or the blowing of the seven trumpets, the gospel trumpets. Why number seven? Why seven priests and why seven trumpets? It is because God is telling us that as we preach the gospel, the Sabbath must be part of the preaching of the gospel, the seven day Sabbath. So that the world, as we preach to them, the last warning message, the seventh warning messages. The Sabbath is part of the gospel. People would know and make a decision for or accept or reject. But remember, as you reflect on this, only Rahab and her family, family's life was spared. Why? Because of the red cord they hang in the window which symbolically represents the blood of Jesus Christ. So as you listen to the presentation this evening, and as we are telling you that the seventh day Sabbath is important and that we have to observe it because Jesus has redeemed us from sin. We are saying that his blood alone will atone us. Make your calling and election sure. Accept Jesus Christ as your savior before it is too late. So that when the destruction of, of this Jericho spiritual Jericho, when the destruction of this world will take place at the ending of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, which is the gospel of the kingdom, when the gospel of the kingdom will have been sounded and there is a cessation or an end to the preaching of the gospel, your life will be spared because you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Praise God. God for the clear word of God. Praise God. The Bible says, when the word is preached, then we should not harden our hearts. So God has spoken clearly through his man's servant. And it is our desire and this network that you and I, we all will adhere to the clear preaching of the word of God. Because someday God is going to hold us accountable 
based on what we do with this clear preaching of his word. I just want to thank Pastor, uh, my friend, uh, Pastor um, Lawrenson, or Dr. Lawrenson, uh, for blessing us in, in such a, a mock way. But just before uh, we end, we're going to call upon Pastor Lawrence one more time to pray for us. You know, Pastor, uh, as our faces differ, so are our various wants and need. The last time you were here, there's a beautiful voice that said to you what they appreciate. In fact, when you weren't here the other day um, after your show, there's a previous beautiful voice that was articulating what you did in the previous show, how you have talked, used the Bible to compare Genesis with Revelation, Exodus with the Re Revelation, and she was just amazed of the great work that God had done in you. I want to let you know that that person is Sister Sarah, and she's standing in need of your prayer now. Not just her, but the entire family. And for her, it's a life and death issue. She can't even speak for herself now because she's not here. So I'm here to speak on her behalf. She needs your prayer. And so perhaps you may have a prayer request out there that you'd like to add to this list. Do you have a prayer, prayer request? Yes, I have several um, members of my congregation who are going through crisis right now. There is one particular sister. She has a, um, well, she has, she has died and the doctors brought her back to life. Mm -hmm. And um, she has a particular, she has part of her lung is not functioning well. And she um, has a specific medication that she's using that is costing uh, $15,000 a month. And she's poor. She don't have the means. And somehow God provided an angel through a particular doctor who decided to let her have the medication without spending a dime. Without spending a dime. This sister right now depends on that medication to survive. And there are other cases like her where people's life are literally hanging on a string and only that string is the grace and mercies of God. So I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up in prayer, Sister Sarah. Her need, her family's situation is acutely, imperatively, urgently requires your divine attention. God, in your mercies, please reach out to her. We are preaching tonight about grace, the cord, the red cord in Rahab's window. Let your blood, the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, hang on to her window so that all of her household's life will be spared in the name of Jesus. Dear God, it is not by accident, but by divine providence that this message comes tonight in such a clear manner. It has nothing to do with me. It is all about the inspiration of the word of God, how God speaks directly to us and touches our hearts and reaches out to us in ways that no one else can. Father, I pray for healing upon those who are sick, those who are suffering. Lord God, you are the healer. You are the healer of mankind. We embrace, we accept by faith. Do not judge us based upon our sins and our, our unworthiness, but through the merits of your son, Jesus Christ alone, because through him alone is salvation and therefore mercy and truth and healing must come from him alone. So I pray your blessing upon this ministry. Bless your servant, Pastor Bonaby, his wife, his family. Continue to embrace them. Continue to shower blessings upon them. Breakthrough in the name of Jesus. The Jabez prayer on their behalf in the name of Jesus. And we will give you all the praise, the glory, all the honor for what you have done in the past. 
what you're doing right now and what you will do in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My pastor, truly, I have been blessed. My family as well as many family need to hear this timely message today. And so off, on behalf of all of us, my family, and your family, and all of God's families all over the world, we just want to thank you for permitting the Holy Spirit uh, to work through you to be a blessing to all of us. Amen. We give God the praise. And also, we want, also want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center um, for sponsoring this show uh, this evening uh, as well. Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, your one-stop shop for all your health and wellness needs. At Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, you'll find Primary Care Clinic, Frugal Health and Wellness Store. The Frugal Health and Wellness Store is a health store with a difference, offering supplements, herbal blends, teas, vitamins, essential oils, vegetarian meatless protein, and wellness classes. Call us. Let us cater for your events. When it is time to take care of your annual or chronic health care needs, visit a clinic or schedule a televisit online or by phone. Call us at 470-880- 8080 to make an appointment or visit ornaldoswift.com to book an appointment online. With over 38 years of practice, we specialize in internal medicine, general practice, mental health, wound and ostomy care. Dr. Palmer and his team invites you to visit Ornaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center, located at 5386 Snapfinger Woods Drive, Decatur, Georgia. While you're there, visit a natural juice and smoothie bar, sample or vegan salads and snacks at the in-store deli. You can call in your order at 770-900-900. 79. Shop in store or order on DoorDash. Again, we want to thank the Arnaldo Swift Health and Wellness Center for sponsoring the, the show. And if you have a business, we're asking you to reach out to us so we can discuss how you can sponsor a show, our series of show. And also we want to remind those to, to be a part of our 12 stars club or 12 star club are those who contribute financially on a monthly basis to help with the monthly operational budget uh, of this ministry and so we want to encourage you if you're not already are a 12 stars club member uh, to become a 12 star club member again my doctor friend my, my colleague my pastoral friend pastor Larison, I truly have been blessed. So I want to say thank you one more time. And for the wider audience, we just want to thank you for joining us this evening. We hope something has been said that resonates with you, that impact your life to totally surrender your heart to, to Jesus Christ. And so we're looking forward for us to be here tomorrow again at 